All right. Good morning, sisters. It's so good to see everyone on this beautiful uh, Saturday morning. We thank God he's given us another opportunity to come together as ladies for our combined ladies class. Um, last week, we were blessed by the Bridgeport Church of Christ ladies, where Sister Erica Wesley uh, came to us with the message. He came back seeing from John chapter nine. And this week, the Lord is blessing us to have the Manchester Church of Christ facilitate our class today. And I know they're going to bless us with a wonderful word from God and wonderful encouragement. Let us welcome the Manchester Church of Christ. Welcome, ladies. Um, we are so happy that we are able to have our sister Beth from Manchester um, do this class for us. I just wanted to start this class by bringing us all into a prayer into the grace of the Lord. So if we could just bow, that'd be lovely. Father God, creator of heaven and earth, we thank you so much for this um, wonderful time that we're living in, the fact that we can share with all our sisters across the world and just join together in fellowship. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for how wonderful you are towards us. Mm -hmm. We ask you that you keep us safe during these uncertain times and that you not let us waver because we know that if we keep our eyes on you, everything will be okay, my Lord. Mm -hmm. We also come to you and we ask you that you forgive us because we know that we fall short of your glory every single day, my Lord. You know our weaknesses and you know um, our love for you. So give us the strength to walk in the steps of Jesus. We also ask you, Father, that you may bless this class and that Beth may be able to speak somebody um, personally and that whatever she's teaching us, that it may strengthen our faith, our faith and our walk in you. We thank you, Father, and we ask you to be with each one of us and that you may give us your everlasting peace during these times. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joanna. We're going to start with a song that um, will lead us a little bit into what Beth is going to speak to today. Jesus told a story that I could share Who was looking for that precious proof across the bed When you found it again, just what you do so I was looking for a thing now it's in his bed. He was looking for some thing now it's in his bed. He was so good. I was just he was looking across the land, now it's in his from your life, are you willing to surrender? Find what I try. Jesus Christ is a way to go back to death. I'm just I can't say your voice. It's a thing, 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 it's a good thing. Amen. 
The king of heaven is like a merchant seeing beauty, beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. One second, ladies. Sorry, try to get to my other screen. <laughs> is it right here? It might get it, but it's not letting me go to the next screen. Oh, there it is. Okay. We wanted to introduce Miss Beth Stafford. Sister Beth Stafford was born and raised in Flint, Michigan by loving Christian parents. She is the middle daughter of four children and was baptized into the Lord's family when she was 16. Beth earned a BSW from Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas, where she met and married her best friend and now husband of 47 years, Scott. They have two girls, five grandchildren, one great grandchild and another one due in August. Beth earned a Master of Management degree from Cambridge College in 2009. She recently retired from an enjoyable career in social services that spanned 50 years. Her social work experience enriched her life, gave her a better understanding of the world's complex needs, and allowed her to do something to help. Beth is passionate about women's ministries and loves serving as a wife of a man in leadership of the Lord's Church. And now, ladies, here's Miss Beth. Okay. <clears throat> I'm so excited to be with you guys uh, this morning. And um, my topic uh, began actually last September when we were at the uh, Vanderbrook uh, Ladies Retreat. And we talked about it. it was kind of a devotional thought. And since then, it's really been laid on my heart to when we were given this opportunity by Myra to uh, bring it to um my sisters in this broader circle. Um, thinking about a pearl really comes in three different ways. Uh, one is an imitation, one is a cultured pearl, and one is in the natural. And imitation, what I learned from this, if you cut a pearl in half, the imitation would be hollow, nothing there, because it could be made out of glass or plastic, any anything like that. The uh, cult, cultivated pearl, gets man's help. It still comes out of a mollusk, but a man intervenes and places some an irritant in the um, in the mollusk and the mollusk does its work to prefer, to protect itself, which creates a pearl. But in the natural, I think it very unique that the oyster itself, if you look at an oyster, is not very attractive on the outside, kind of rough around the edges, but it has this defense on the inside Something as small as a grain of sand could get into the lining of the pearl and it goes right to work trying to protect the pearl itself from the, what invades it. And I'm thinking about our lives. Sometimes we become our most beautiful and our strongest from an irritant. And um, it could be disease, it could be a job loss, it could be a personal struggle or a vice. And a lot of times when we survive that, uh, we come out so much stronger. I also wanted to tell you, like the pearl of great price uh, parable could be a lot of things. Uh, it could, it, the one I'm using is kind of like Jesus leaving heaven to find the kingdom of God and us being that pearl that we would be worth him leaving the 99 for just one of us. And that is very humbling to me that we serve a God that um, Debbie introduced me to a song last week that that uh, sings um, the creator of the universe knows my name. So today is going to be a good day. 
And that has just really stuck with me for this whole thing. I'm trying to bring you along with me of our value. And um, Jesus was willing to give everything he had up for us. Mm -hmm. He left heaven for goodness sake. <laughs> you know, it's like no pain, no sorrow. He took on a decaying body. Can you imagine what that felt like to, to God to come into our, our world, our existence? And yet he did that because of his love. <clears throat> and John 3, 16 tells us why, right? That he so loved the world. And also in, in John talks about him loving us first. It wasn't we were seeking a God. He sought us, wanted to be with us. And um, that just humbles me so much. And I think sometimes women over the course of time could even feel less in the way culture has treated us, the world has treated us, and look at the love that Jesus gave women and surrounded himself and uh, valued uh, them in his time which was a radical thought as well. So we we live in an amazing time uh, and blessed with an amazing savior. I also wanted to give you a little example of um, a gift that my husband uh, had given me a string of pearls uh, back in our uh, young marriage. And I had been struggling with a little bit of weight and he gave me like a choker type of, of pearl necklace. And I was thinking at first on my darker side, because I wasn't really where I wanted to be in life. I think, I think it's your mother who likes pearls, not me. <laughs> and I had this strand of pearls. When he put them on and he was so excited, I felt like if I flex my neck, they're going to burst. So I sat there, you know, and it was really this tormenting time for a woman who did not feel good about herself. Later down the road, um, I put them on and I had lost some weight and they actually hung right. And I was so happy. And when I kind of nudged my husband at church and said, do you notice anything? He goes, oh, you're wearing your pearls. And to my amazement, that man's joy was the same as the day he gave him when I wasn't in the right place because he knew why he bought them, how he purchased them, what he sacrificed to get them, and who he loved that he wanted to be able to wear them. And I think that that's how we view our Christianity sometimes too. Where we are, we might not um, really truly value what Jesus did for us. That doesn't make him love us less. Doesn't make him regret his choice to come get us or come or come again. But um, it's where the um, it's where the dark place that we tend to be sometimes that we don't appreciate the gift or the giver. So that's the that's where I want to resonate with you today. Help this resonate with you. Where are you? Are you in a pretty good space? Are you in a dark place? Do you need to be reminded that you're worth something? Um, I hope you have people in your life, your sisters, your family, your church that value you and that you feel valued. And um, I'm hoping that our lesson today will give you enough meat in the scriptures to uh, help you see the value that you have to Jesus, that he would see it worthwhile to leave all the comforts, the glory, the presence of his father to come down offer us a salvation to redeem us. <clears throat> and then when he had to leave, didn't leave without leaving us a comforter. So we have the power of three wrapped in one, the father, the creator, the savior, the uh, mediator, and the comforter. And I'm hoping that whatever um, spirit of God you need in that, in the presence of him would be what you need today. That, um, we can have a little bit of heaven on earth because the presence of God is heaven. And we have the presence of God uh, living with us, in us, for us, about us. Uh, we are surrounded sisters and we, we should have no fear, uh, faith over fear. And um, as we go through this, I'm hoping that uh, you will see that, feel it, and maybe reach out uh, to others. The other thing I'd like to talk to you about before we get into, I did like an acronym of PEARL, 
and an acronym of NACRE, which is the mother pearl that protects the inside of the pearl. So you'll have some scripture to go along with that. But I also want to give you this thought. If God, if you look at God as a master jewel, jeweler, pearls have to be strung correctly, laid correctly, and there's a little, they're on this fine silk thread, and they are graduated to where they lay nice on, um, on your neck, on your chest, and they tie a little knot between each pearl. And we're going to talk about the beauty of this design and the spiritual context. So you have a master jeweler that's going to uh, string these pearls, tying a little knot between each pearl. And the knot helps the pearls to lay well, to be presented in a, in a nice manner, but also the little knot helps them from rubbing against each other. Because if pearls rub against each other, they could take the luster or the, or the mother pearl off their sisters that are with them on the pearls. So it protects, it lays, and also if it's broken, they don't scatter everywhere. So I want you to be thinking of that when we're talking about uh, who's on your string of pearls, who's sitting close to you that you may would rub, rub. Oops, okay, uh, that you might rub the wrong way if uh, if it weren't for Jesus being the knot between you. So uh, when you think about that, and then some of us may need to even restring our pearls. Maybe there's some that you need to have on there that aren't there, or maybe there are some people that uh, should not necessarily be in your close, in your close circle. Maybe love them and be with them, but maybe not in your close circle. Um, Morgan Freeman had, uh, had a saying that I loved. Um, he said that if people are removed from your life, you might, you might want to think about it this way. God may have heard something you didn't hear see something you didn't see, and they were moved for a reason. So when you're thinking about who's in your close circle, and that's what we're talking about today, you are a pearl. You are worth a great price. You were worth Jesus coming to die for. And you want to make sure that you're strong with people who feel the same way and that love him and that will help you in the best way possible uh, as women and if, as his daughters. So in the uh, first, um, we're the, we are the pearl of great price. We were what Jesus came to redeem, to save, to come back for. It is the reason he went back to prepare a room for us. Think about that. We're, we have a room, room being prepared for us, and we uh, already have our name. Uh, he knows our name. He has a place prepared for us, and we should live with joy um, in all of that and look forward to being with God in heaven. So we're going to go down through the five characteristics that I pulled from just the name of Pearl with some scriptures that you can uh, think about and meditate on, and um, hopefully it will strengthen you. So the first one is your precious. And Debbie will read our scripture. Psalm 139, 16. Oh. <clears throat> Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Just let that pour over you. How precious you are. If you have a child, you know exactly what God thought. Mm -hmm. If you love a child, you know exactly what God thought. If you're an older sister to a child or to a young woman, you know exactly what God thought. We are precious. How many times have you seen something like that or some equality in your sister? You said, she's precious. That word just exudes a wonderful thought, doesn't it? That we're precious in his sight. That before we were ever formed, he knew he designed, he thought before we ever lived one day of our life. Mm -hmm. That should give you chills down your back. Mm -hmm. You look like you look because he thinks it's beautiful. 
sometimes I think he had a sense of humor when he gave me my fee <laughs> on that day. <laughs> but I've learned to respect them and they're useful. <laughs> and, you know, laugh with God if there's something about your body that you think is kind of cute or funny or quirky. But he's not really concerned about your outward appearance anyway. He's after the heart, mm -hmm. but I think he had fun designing us. Not one of us are alike. We are as a unique, do you know, as the star, that fingerprints, stars are unique. Did you know the pearl is? They're not any two alike. How does he do that? Snowflakes. Think about that. And you, you are one of a kind and yet women compare. We're always comparing. That job's already taken, already given to someone. My granddaughter would say, stay in your own lane. <laughs> you know, be, be your person and enjoy being you because God designed you. The master designer designed you. Put your name there. You're precious in his name. The E, ever evolving. Romans 12, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good and pleasing and perfect will. <clears throat> On my best days, I pray that prayer in the morning. I turn Romans 12, one and two into a prayer. You can do that too. As you're laying there and you wake up, ask God that you actually give your mind your hands, your feet, your body to him. Sacrificially. My mouth is probably the worst for me to have to tell him he can have, but you need to start your day like that, that everything you do will be in a sacrificial offering to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then we are told, don't conform to this world. The minute you step out of bed, maybe in your own home, because we all clean up pretty well, but there are some sad things that happen in our homes, in Christian homes. Sometimes you got to get out of your own home to have any peace or to have happiness or to have joy. But if you live that sacrificial way and you love those people that even are unkind to you before you ever enter into the world, You've already pleased your father. And that ever evolving and finding peace that he gives you, the Bible tells us it passes all understanding. We can live in peace because if we have peace with him, we will ever evolve to what he wants us to be. And in that scripture that Debbie just read to us, I'm just going to stop here for a second. Sometimes Call a sister and let her read to you. I love to be read to. And it's okay to call your sister and say, would you read this to me? <laughs> Maybe it's better than saying, did you hear about, you know, but anyway, that's just a side note. Um, you can have your sisters read to you. That scripture in, the, in verse two tells us we will change our thinking. Mm -hmm. That we are ever evolving. Mm -hmm. We will be sacrificial in our lives. We will be good to our homes, no matter what we live in. We'll be good to the people that we live with. We'll step out into the world and let God transform us. We are not of this world. And Jesus' prayer said, it's not his place, that it, his desire to take us out of the world. He realizes we have to live in it. But we don't have to be a part of it. Let that resonate with you, ever evolving. What do you need to strike from your life to change it 
in a way of your thinking, your being, and your doing that will, that will please your Savior. You can start that every morning with me. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there's 30 or so of us on this together, whoever? Wouldn't it be wonderful for God to wake up tomorrow morning? For As we wake up tomorrow morning, he does not need to sleep. He's up. He's up. So we don't have to be. <laughs> That's wonderful. But wouldn't it be wonderful for him to hear first thing in the morning? And even from Africa to America, we've got all of this wonderful capability that he would hear us all pray Romans 12, 1 and 2. <laughs> And, and um, personalize it. Think about it. Let's fill his room. Let's fill his throne with our, our wanting to be sacrificial living and us wanting to um, change our thinking and to be his pearls in this world. <clears throat> Number three, attractive. <laughs> First Peter three, verse four, rather, it should be the of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Again, we're talking about that, um, the beauty from within, right? We worry so much on the product we put on our face and in our hair and our clothing and our adornment. If we work that hard on our spirit to be attractive. Have you ever been with someone you thought was beautiful? And you thought, well, I'd love to be like her. And you spend some time and you're thinking, I don't know what happened. She's not as attractive to me as she was. Or just the opposite. Maybe you've judged, I wish she'd do something with her hair. I wish, she'd, you know, like the, our, all of our girl things in there. And then all of a sudden she becomes very beautiful to you because you're seeing what God sees. You're seeing kindness. You're seeing joyful. You're seeing a self, selfless woman. It's attractive. So let's try to be, do to our best ability to be attractive before God. Give him the heart he wants. Give him the face he wants. Give him um, our judgments, our comparisons, and really try to live attractive to our Lord. Number four. Proverbs 31, verse 10, right? <laughs> A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth more than rubies. This one I love. Uh, you're rare in this world. You're so, I hope you know how rare you are. And Proverbs tells you that's all about the beauty of a woman. And it, and it reads in there that it's more precious than rubies. And in some versions, it will mention pearls and it will mention treasures. And I believe it's in Job talked about um, the treasure of being uh, the pearl. The pearl was considered a great treasure, a great find. And here in Proverbs, it's saying that a beautiful woman inside and out and the one that God treasures is rare. So in our world, be the rare. You know, be the be the woman that someone says, oh, to be like her, to have that peace, to have that joy, to have that kindness. We should be so rare that people are seeking us, wanting to know where does that joy come from? And then the Bible tells us, be ready to tell them. But, you know, why are you? Why are you joyful? A lot of you are dealing with a lot of stuff every day from jobs to family to relationships and all that that goes with it. And yet you're joyful. Why? Because this world is not our home. And the world should see that it's a rarity to be content. The world tells us we shouldn't be content. We should be ambitious. We should want. We should do. We should have and God is counter-cultural, right? He's not after those things. He wants us to be rare, to seek for him, to be with him, to love people, to love first. Love first. Listen, lean in. Hear someone's pain before you tell them how to fix it. Maybe it's your place to listen. Maybe it's your place to build a relationship before you give critique. When you're in love 
and you're in a love relationship, people can hear you say something they may not want to hear otherwise. If they know you love them and you've prayed about it and you go about it in the right way, you're rare. Before you talk about your sister, before you talk about something you don't like, go to prayer. Ask God what he sees. Look at Jesus, the woman that was drugged in front of him half naked. By the way, the man was not, which really irritates me. But, <laughs> but I feel like Jesus stooped, took, his, took their eyes off of that woman. He was God. He could have wrung her out and set her straight and taken care of all of them. He did not do that. Wouldn't you love to know what he wrote in the sand? <laughs> did he just do it as kind of squirrel, get, get your eyes off her? Or was he writing names of the people in the crowd? Was he writing sins? Was he drawing a picture? Did he draw a question mark? All I know is he took his eye, he took the public eye off of her, which were rare in that world. A religious leader back then would have had her stone burned, cast, whatever, and he did not do that. He told her at the end, after everybody had gone, where are your accusers, right? And go and sin no more. He did not leave what he needed to tell her, but he didn't choose to embarrass her or to bring her lower than anybody else in that crowd. Do we do that? If we do, we're rare. It's a rarity to love a person first. And I beg you to love, love the world first, but love your sister deeper and first. And get that relationship there and solid before you have to bring up something that might not be as comfortable. If they know you're doing it in love and you've been transparent, and they know that you're dealing with a few things yourself, you'll have a base for a transitional, rare opportunity to help your sister to be the best she can be. And in that, you'll be the best you can be. So the last, uh, the last letter is L. <clears throat> and we have two scriptures, Romans 8, 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Do you want me to do Corinthians? Yes, yes please. <laughs> and 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. The God of this age <clears throat> has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays in the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So this is really exciting, a luster. <clears throat> you know that a pearl has light. When a light is shown on a pearl, it's something that comes up from the inside out. And um, in 2 Corinthians, it talks about the world can't see that light. Who's the, who's the king of this world? He makes sure that it stays dull. But pearls in the natural as well, do you know that pearls will gain luster by being worn? Things like hairspray and irritants and pollutants and all that kind of can dull the pearl, but your body oils, when they're laying next to you, nurture the pearl. The pearl you are on a body that's serving the Lord will nurture the pearl with the oil of you. We're told to be the aroma of Christ, to be his love letter. And when you're living that life, you will shine in a world that does not understand light. John 10, 10 is one of my favorites. What does Satan do? He wants to kill, rob, destroy. But what does Jesus do? He comes to give life. And that would be wonderful in itself. But the second part of that, to the full, 
He wants you to have life to the full. And that's that luster. And wearing the pearl and wearing your sisters close to you with Jesus in between each of you will only make you shine brighter. Mm-hmm. Shine brighter. <clears throat> string your pearls well. Let God string who needs to sit next to you, Christ in the middle. And let the oil of your life, the service, to, the servitude of your life, the love of your life, be what brings the luster. You are a pearl of great price. Okay. Yeah. Um, Nacre is, is pronounced Nacre. It's up there for you. It's the oyster's defense. And I'm liking that to our spiritual defense. So the acronym of NACR we're going to do is in um, the beauty and the blessing of the Holy Spirit in our lives that protect us. You think about um, something that protects, seals. You know, when, when you have a wound in the oyster, the irritant is a wound, is a foreign object, and the spirit living within the oyster, the mother of pearl, the nacre, rallies everything that God's given it to protect, keeps layering, layering, layering until there's a beautiful result, the pearl of great price. So the first letter, in. First Corinthians 3, verse 16. <clears throat> oh is that right yes <laughs> don't you know that you yourself are god's temple and that god's spirit dwells in your midst the very power that god used to raise jesus lives in each of us if we are his and yet we never tap into that power do we very rarely i should say Sometimes we forget that that's there uh, to protect us and to help us um, with the the irritants of life. Uh, When do you uh, most rely on God? Is it in the times that you're pretty much in control or you feel you are the illusion of control? Or is it when you have been stripped of um, any type of power and um, it's when you need God the most? You're in the natural. God gave you his spirit to live inside you. There's nothing that can conquer you because he's with you. So as as I was telling you, that imitation pearl, if you cut it into, there's nothing, it's hollow. Man's pearl, the cultured pearl, if you cut into it, it'll show what he implanted. But the natural, the pearl of the nat- in the natural, if you cut the pearl in the natural in two, guess what you see? It's like onion layers, layer upon layer upon layer, marbled. Of all the times he's protected you, he's strengthened you, he's developing your pearl. It may be well into your life um, when you feel that your youth is gone, that you see the true pearl that uh, God's created into you and uh, you've survived, that you've been resilient, that you have something to offer, that you can help um, younger women as they're developing their pearl. You can come along inside and say, I remember that struggle. I thought I was going to die, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And you can hold hands, you can sit close, You know what? And like we said earlier, you can call and just read to someone. Find a scripture you love. Find a prayer you've written out of scripture. Find a psalm, a proverb. Call one of your sisters. Maybe she's not really ready to talk yet. Say, hey, I found something. Can I read it to you? Be in the natural. Use God's word to help teach, heal, exhort, correct, and do it all in love. Our next letter. Ephesians 1 13. 
And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The letter A is for Abel. And um, I love the word, word sealed. And I learned something the other day when I, when I was studying, and I want to share this with you. When God placed Noah and Noah built the ark and all the animals were on board. And, you know, we've been told and uh, instructed in our, in our lessons as children, who closed the ark? Did man close it? No. God sealed the ark with the people and the animals in it. It wasn't the boat that saved, the ark that saved. Wasn't, wasn't that structure that withheld water from sinking, capsizing, or flooding the boat. It was because God sealed it, that it was safe. And when you've accepted Jesus and you've been baptized into his church and into his way, you're sealed. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing. Read Romans 8. <laughs> nothing can take that away from you because God sealed you. God gave you his Holy Spirit to live inside you. Think of us as women in our kitchens. Don't we love something that seals well? <laughs> we know. We know if we bought something cheaper and it's going to leak or when you drop it, it's going to fall. We love the seal. You are sealed by God. The same as Noah was. The same as every character in the Bible that God allows us to see their faults. He chose them. He sealed them. He saved them. And that is no different from us. He is able. You serve a God who is able to keep you, to seal you, to save you, to redeem you, to raise you, and to have you live with him. Next letter is C for cares. John 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Jesus knew that um, the apostles were very um, concerned and scared. They were starting to see the plan, right? He had died, and he was, um, was going to leave them. And his words out of his mouth in John 14, 16, tell him, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send a comforter. Is there any better word for the Holy Spirit than a comforter? He knew what they would face. He knows what we face. He knows what our world is facing. Some of us can't hardly even listen to the news or pick up a paper. It's terrifying but he cares for us and he gives us a comfort again that no one can understand. They don't understand if you're not worried. They don't understand why you're not. That's all the only thing you talk about is, is what's going on in the world. They don't understand it. They also don't always understand that you're on your knees for the world's problems, that you're praying for the hurting or the abused. <clears throat> for the captive, for the hungry. God cares and he wants us to care. He gave us a comforter and he wants us to share. And when we share our faith, we're giving someone the best thing possible. Women are so quick to share where they got the best deal, the best shoes, the best market, the best play, that you name it, we love to share. And Christ should be right up there with what we share the most, why would we want to keep that to ourselves? Look at the world, look at every person you see, grocery store on the sidewalk, your neighbors and whatever, and think of them as God thinks of them. He cares for them. He died once, and what does the Bible say? For all, not some. He wants all to accept him. He wants all in heaven with him. He cares. 
And he made sure that when Jesus had to leave the earth, we weren't left as orphans. Something was placed in us to help us with compassion and caring, knowledge that we're cared for. R for resilient. Second Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into the image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. He gives us the gift the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of being resilient. I wish we had time to go around our circle this morning. I know there's resilience in the room. You know the resilience you've had. You know the resilience that your sisters have had. Some of you wonder how they're still standing. Some of the hardest things that people have gone through, you're still standing. One of my favorite people in this world was Corey Timboom, who survived the hor horrific um, experience of the Holocaust. And she talks about resilience. She even became very aware of and thankful for fleas because they kept the guards away. What are the fleas in our lives? What are the torments that we live with? Some of you may live in abusive homes, abusive relationships. Um, and if it's not physical, it could be abusive words making you feel less every day. And yet the Holy Spirit, our nacre, our mother of pearl, helps us to be resilient. There's nothing in this world that can happen to us that the spirit can't help us to be resilient, to reflect, to come away with and be better for because of, because of the spirit in us. And the last one is E for environment. Matthew 13, 18 through 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. <clears throat> this is the seed sown along the path. The seed fallen on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred. 60 or 30 times what was sown. So our environment <laughs> is important, isn't it? What ground has God sown you? Where are you right now? Maybe where you came from is not where you are. What your past is not, you know, does not define our future. Maybe you started out in poorer soil and now you're in rich soil. My prayer is that we can all move to that environment of good soil. The pearl also, uh, the, way, the way it grows, the health of it, the size of it, did you realize it all comes from its environment? It can be too cold. It can be too wet. It can uh, have pollutants. It has enemies. And, and funny, a funny thing that I found was one of the enemies of a pearl 
or the mollusk is a devil fish. And I just had to kind of uh, see the humor in that when our our worst anemone is, is Satan as well, the devil fish. But that's one of the pearl's greatest enemies. So it's got some natural enemies. It's got environmental enemies. And then I was telling you about pollutants such as hairspray, um, heat. It doesn't do well with heat. It destroys pearls and things like that. So we have to worry about our environment. What will take our luster? What will take our beauty? What will take our, um, you know, this valuable thing? If you lose your um, your nake or your mother of pearl that's scratched off or whatever, it's not that you will be completely destroyed, but you can't get it back. It doesn't grow back. And some of us are there. Some of us have been scraped and scratched and that might not come back, but we hang on to that string because we know um, our place in there and where God placed us and the value of the pearl. And you treasure it and you take care of it and you do the best you can in your environment that you're placed. And you try to choose the best environment, no matter where our physical environment is, would be the spiritual environment. And that is really in the realm of being in God's word, praying, talking to God. Find a place in your home that you can talk to God. And you know what? If your home's not peaceful enough for that, then get somewhere outside or in your car. I don't care where it is. Find a place just like you would with a best friend and go sit. And sit still as much as you talk. Praise him first. Confess where you're at. Thank him for what he's done. And ask for what you need and what others need. That's that acts way to pray. And sometimes it's just good to sit in there to think about the adoration and praise the confession, the thankfulness, and the supplication. If you do those few things religiously, daily, and you offer that prayer of Romans 12, 1 and 2, of, of really giving your life as a sacrifice to your Lord and asking him to change your thinking, you will become a different person. Your past does not define your future. Don't let the evil one tell you it does. And when he gets in your face and reminds you of everything you've done, it's true, you've done it. Remind him of his future and move on. You know, if you, Zechariah 3, is one of my favorite uh, books and, and chapters. Zechariah 3. The high priest, a man by the name of Joshua, is standing before God, his accusers right in his face. He's pointing out everything that man ever did. Man really can't deny him. He did it, right? He's there in kind of scruffy clothes, beaten down. Satan thinks he has the upper hand. But you know what God did? God said, no, Satan. I say, no, I pulled him from the fire. And then he has a new robe brought for the priest. And this is what you got to love about your God. He then says, and a turban for his head. <laughs> you can smile in the face of accusation. You're not denying that you've sinned, you're not denying of your past, but you've got a God who holds your future. He's put a robe on you, turban for your head, and a home, a room, a room he's creating. And Jesus says, if I go and prepare it, I'm coming back. And God spares everybody, even Jesus, from knowing when that day is. But he is coming back might be in our lifetime. Some of you might really want that to happen. But he's coming. 
Your room's ready. You serve a Lord that knows your name. I beg you to be the pearl. And stay even the pearl with the little knots. Remember we said if it breaks, they don't scatter. You don't lose them all. Churches break because we're people. We disappoint ourselves. We disappoint others. We disappoint God. But that doesn't mean we'll scatter. We'll be restrung. Gather up all you can and restrain. Be a gatherer, not a pearl thrower. And the Bible also tells us, don't cast your pearls before swine. I know that sounds really rough, but what it means is some, there are some things that are so precious that some won't get, and you can't share it with them. Pray for them, love them. But spend your time on developing the pearls, protecting the pearls, and loving the pearls that want to be pearls for God. Put your string together. And then I would like, um, I'd like to just pray with you real quick. And then this song, Wonderful, Merciful Savior, is one of my favorites. And I just want you to let that pour over you and through you. Sing with it. Sing loud. We can put it on mute and just bellow out. We, we don't have to do anything. Just sing that song. But if you will with me on your legs, if you'll press down with your hands and pray with me the prayer of release. And you can name it. You can write it down. What do you need to release? Anger, fear, pain, sorrow. Name them. Name the people who cause them, but press it down and release. You'll open your hands. On, let them rest lightly on your legs. This is the posture of receiving. Receive his love. Receive his protection, his kindness, his goodness, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace. Name what you need there. Name where you feel you failed. Name the blessings and the thankfulness that only he can give, the peace only he can give. Just sit there for a second in his wonderful grace. And finally, if you'll put your hands out and push out, just push out like you're pushing against something very strong. This is the posture of resist. Say no to Satan. If you've ever seen the war room, go on a tangent. She kicks him out of the house. Kick him out of your mind. He has no place at your table. He has no place at your heart. He has no place in your relationships. He is not welcome. Push him away. 